everybody and welcome to today's webinar to Boldly Flow, an in-depth look at all the steps that should be considered before starting a flow cytometry experiment and some tips on data analysis. Whether you're new to flow cytometry or have been acquiring samples for years, we will show you how to get the most from your experiments and how our panel builder can help you at each step, whether you're building a four color or 24 color panel. Your host today is Mike Blundell. Mike graduated from the University of Edinburgh with a Bachelor's of Science in Immunology. He then moved to University College London, where he joined the group of Professor Adrian Thrasher and obtained his PhD. His thesis research was focused on the primary immunofficiency with Scott Aldrich syndrome, where he contributed to over 50 peer-reviewed papers. He investigated novel activating mutations and developed lentiviral vectors for use in gene therapy treatments, which have now been successfully used in clinical trials. Mike left academia three years ago to become a product manager for flow cytometry here at BioRad. We're trying to make this webinar as interactive as possible, so please submit any questions or comments via the Q&A box located at the bottom of the screen throughout the webinar. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible in the session following the main presentation. Should any questions remain unanswered, we will reply by email. You can also join in the conversation on our social media channels by using the BioRad Webinars hashtag. The webinar will be recorded and an on-demand version will be available shortly after the webinar on the BioRad Antibodies website where you'll find all of our previous flow cytometry webinars and blogs. A link to this recording will be emailed to you. Should you encounter any technical problems during the webinar, please click on the question mark at the bottom of the screen. This will bring up the technical guide which describes solutions for the most common technical problems. I hope you'll enjoy the webinar and I'll now hand over to Mike. Hello everyone and welcome to today's flow cytometry webinar. We'll start by giving you a brief overview of today's topics. We will cover nine topics that are essential to consider before you embark on a flow cytometry experiment, such as the instrument you're going to use, which antibodies and which fluorophores you should use. I will discuss some experimental techniques such as sample prep and staining protocols and how the biology of your sample is important in relation to marker expression patterns and cell frequency. Finally, I will briefly discuss the controls you should use and how to analyse your data. Running all the way through this webinar, I will show you how the new panel builder on bioradantibodies.com can assist you with your experiment and show whilst it is great for experts building large panels, it can also be used to help those with less flow experience. So let's start with the instrument. Before you start, you need to know how many lasers and which filters you have available to use. Cytometers have from one to five or even more lasers and determine which fluorophores and how many you can use. The filters are equally as important as using an incorrect filter for your fluorophore will mean you will get no or suboptimal data or data that cannot be properly analyzed. Cytometers such as the ZE5 have five spatially separated lasers and 27 fluorescent detectors, allowing greater flexibility than instruments with fluor lasers in detectors. Using a cytometer that has collinear lasers, such as the S3E, whilst fantastic for sorting cells, may not be compatible with some fluorophore combinations. The speed of acquisition may also influence your instrument choice, as rare cell populations may require you to collect many cells. Using an instrument that has high speed, such as ZD5, will greatly reduce this acquisition time. So let's look at how the panel builder can help. There are two options. You can search by your institute if you have your institute specific cytometers preloaded. This allows you to select the specific instrument you will use. If your institute is not present, then you can also select an instrument from most manufacturers from a drop down menu. Once you select an instrument, you can look at the configuration and check the laser, the filters, and the compatible fluorophores on that laser. Furthermore, if you have a custom instrument, you can change the lasers and filters to fit your custom build. So you've chosen your cytometer. Next, I want to talk to you about the importance of good sample preparation, what you should consider when harvesting cells from different tissues, and why careful sample preparation is essential to obtain viable cells, enabling you to have high-level flow cytometry data. Accurate flow cytometry relies on generation of a high-quality single-cell suspension. So what are the considerations when making single cell suspensions? Firstly, what's your starting sample? If you're growing cells in culture, 
we will have to take into account whether the cells are in suspension or adherent. Suspension cells often need only to be harvested and washed to remove contaminating proteins or cell debris. The cells can then be resuspended at the correct concentration and stained. If you are using adherent cells, you will have to consider the method which is best to detach the cells from the flask. Commonly, trypsin is used to create single cell suspensions when passaging cells. However, this can be damaging if left on the cells too long. It may not be the best method for some surface markers as the trypsin can cleave epitopes, resulting in no or reduced staining. There are more common, there are more common gentle methods of creating single cell suspensions, such as using acutase. This is used at a lower concentration than trypsin and preserves more epitopes. After detachment, cells can be washed and resuspended again at the right concentration. Some cells, such as primary macrophages and dendritic cells, are often better harvested by scraping to try and be as gentle as possible. However, whatever method you choose, there will always be a loss of cells and dead cells present. If you're looking at secondary lymphoid tissue, such as thymus, spleen or lymph nodes, you will have to mechanically disaggregate the tissue. Care has to be taken as being too aggressive will lead to many dead cells, whilst being too gentle may lead to ineffective cell recovery. More gentle techniques can be used, such as flushing out cells using needle and syringe, but again cell recovery may be reduced. After harvesting, the cells again are washed and resuspended at the right concentration prior to staining. Finally, after you have made a single cell suspension, it's often good to pass the cells through a filter to remove any remaining clumps or debris. In order to make a single cell suspension from bone marrow, the bones need to be harvested with as little muscle as possible. The ends are removed and the bone marrow core can be flushed out uh, using a needle and syringe. The bone marrow plug can then be disaggregated into a single cell suspension by passing through a fine gauge needle, followed by being passed again through a filter to ensure there's no contamination from pieces of muscle or bone. After disaggregation, the cells can be washed and resuspended again, ready for staining. Another popular sample used in flow cytometry is peripheral blood. For most antibody staining, any of the common anticoagulants such as heparin, acid citrate or EDTA are fine to prevent blood clotting. However, for some techniques such as intracellular cytokine detection and certain surface epitopes such as integrins, it is advisable not to use EDTA. If you are unsure, you can check the data sheet of your antibody prior to blood collection. Red blood cells make up about 95% of whole blood and can make detecting the leukocytes difficult during analysis. Therefore, removal of the red cells is an important step which can be done before or after staining. If removing the red cells is not an option, you can use CD45 staining to gate out the red blood cells as they will be negative. One method to remove red cells is to use density gradients such as FICOL or Lymphoprep shown on this slide. Here, the blood is diluted one-to-one -one with either PBS or RPMI and slowly layered on top of the FICOL. This is then centrifuged to separate the different fractions. The red blood cells pass through the FICOL due to their higher density, whereas the mononuclear cells are trapped at the interface between the FICOL and plasma. What should be noted is that the granulocytes will also pass through the FICOL layer, so this is not suitable if this is a cell population you're interested in. Platelets are found in the plasma layer. The second method to remove red cells is to use hypotonic lysis. This method allows you to remove the red cells whilst preserving all the other populations in your sample. Methods include using water, ammonium chloride or specialised red cell lysis solutions such as erythrolyse. With all lysis methods, care has to be taken to ensure you get sufficient lysis of the red cells to enable you to distinguish the leukocytes without leaving the red cells too long in the lysin solution which will lead to an increase in cell death. In addition to mechanical disruption, extraction of certain cells from secondary lymphoid tissue and cells from solid organs can require enzymatic digestion. The enzymes are required to break down the extracellular matrix and are often tissue specific. Without use of the enzyme, you may not obtain a single cell suspension or you may not release your cell of interest, leading to underestimation of your cell numbers. A couple of examples of where enzymes are required are with F480 positive macrophages and follicular dendritic cells. Although F480 staining is really strong on spleen sections, 
Red port macrophages are not readily released with physical treatment alone. To release them, collagenase treatment is needed, which cleaves peptide bonds in collagen. For dendritic cells, they are only released from germinal centers with treatment with liberase and DNAs 1. Prior to staining, the cells should be resuspended in an appropriate staining buffer, such as those I have listed on this slide. Because flow cytometry relies upon a stream of single particles, or in this case cells, to pass through the laser, it's very important that you should avoid cell clumps. To try and prevent clumping, it is advisable, advisable to have your med all your media and wash buffers at 4 degrees and keep the cells on ice as much as possible, if you can. This will help slow down cell metabolism and reduce the amount of necrosis and apoptosis. Another method of preventing cell clumping is to include DNAs1 or EDTA in your resuspension buffer. When resuspending your cells, there are a few simple things that can be done to help prevent excessive cell death. Firstly, avoid vortexing as this will damage fragile cells. Avoid excessive centrifugation and sediment at the lowest speed you can. Don't aspirate off your media or off your cell pellet as cells will die in a dry pellet. Avoid creating bubbles, as the cell surface tension may damage your cells. And for more information on sample prep can be found on our webinar, Optimize Your Flow Cytometry, available to watch on demand, and we also have blogs available. So the next step is to identify your cells. But how do you do this? Finding the best marker for some cells is relatively straightforward. CD3 for T cells or CD19 for B cells, for example. Identifying specific subsets can be trickier and may involve a lot of background reading. To help you get started, we have an interactive immune cell and marker tool. This allows you to search for any immune cell types, such as B cells, shown here. The lineage is shown, and then, if you select a specific cell, such as a marginal B zone B cell, information on the cell and relevant markers are then shown. More information on the marker protein itself the cellular location and a direct link to available antibodies can be obtained by selecting the marker you are interested in. So you've picked the marker that will identify your cells. But what is that marker or antigen's density? And why does it matter? Well, the number of antigen molecules that the cell carries will correlate directly to the intensity of that positive population. In the example given, we see three plots with different antigens all staying with PE. All of them give different intensities as the number of receptors differ for each marker. For instance, the top plot, staying with CD45RA, carrying more than 200,000 surface receptors, are strongly positive. CD5 with around 90,000 are less positive, with CD56 with around 10,000 surface antigens giving a much dimmer positive population. This will, of course, affect your panel. As a general rule, it is good practice to put bright fluorophores on low density markers and dimmer fluorophores on high density markers. So how do you measure antigen density? Well the easiest method uses beads that have a specific antibody binding capacity via the FC portion. If you have bead populations with increased binding capacity as can be seen on this image, the mean fluorescence intensity will directly correlate with the binding capacity of the beads and the standard curve can be obtained as seen here. This standard curve can then be used to obtain values for cells stained with specific markers, such as CD3 on murine spleen, shown in these dot plots. Using this method, the antigen density of many cell markers found on cells such as T, B and myeloid cells can be determined as can be seen in this graph of antigen density on murine splenocytes. We can now use this data to choose the most appropriate fluorophore for each marker. A more detailed look at how to measure the antigen density can be found at www.biradantibodies forward slash antigen density. If we look at three markers in uh, higher, closer detail, we can see that CD3, CD4 and CD25 have three different levels of expression, with CD4 being the highest and CD25 being the lowest. And this will affect which fluorophore should be chosen when building your panel. We can input this antigen density information into our panel builder. If we take a look at CD25, we have selected uh, a low antigen density. 
As you can see, only the bright fluorophores are available to choose, and the dim fluorophores have been excluded. And if we take a look at CD4, where we select a high engine density, the bright fluorophores have been excluded, helping you make the right choice in your panel building. So the next important step is to actually choose your antibody. Unfortunately, not all antibodies work in all applications. Some clones are flow specific, some bind to different portions of a marker, which can lead to very different protocols, for example if it is intracellular rather than an extracellular part. Some clones are also preferred for specific applications, and the type of conjugation can be application specific. The host species the antibody was generated in, and the isotype may be important, especially if you are using secondary antibodies or use isotype controls. This information can be found on our website and datasheets. When you find the right antibody, be sure to titrate it in order to get the highest stain index. In its simplest terms, the stain index is the difference between the positive and negative population. This will help you with the identification of populations in your analysis and will save you money as you'll probably use this antibody. For more information on titration, go to www.bioradantibodies.com forward slash titration. So, how can the panel builder help you choose an antibody? Well, once you have selected your marker, you can narrow down your options by choosing target species, as shown here, the host species, the isotype, or clone. The marker and target species are required, but the others are optional, so you can leave as any if you wish to increase your available options. In addition to the marker density, the frequency of the cell you are interested in is also very important. If you are looking at abundant cells, such as T cells in peripheral blood, which you can see from the table is between 10 and 25%, then it will be relatively easy to collect enough sample to obtain a statistically significant result, and the choice of fluorophore may not be critical. However, if you were to be looking for rarer populations, such as dendritic cells, which are about 0.5 to 1% in peripheral blood, you need to stain and collect 10 times the amount of cells to end up with the same number in your final analysis. In addition, it is better to use bright fluorophores when looking for rare populations to ensure easy identification and separation from the negative. If you are sorting, the frequency will determine the time taken to complete your sort. This can impact on the recovery of viable cells if the sort takes a long time. The frequency of cell populations will differ depending on the tissue sample used and the sample species. For example, granulocytes are much more abundant in human blood compared to murine blood. Another impact of the cell frequency can be seen if you have a complex gating strategy. An example of a gating strategy can be seen on this slide. 100,000 cells were stained with CD3, CD4, CD8, CD127 and CD25. After gating on the forward and side scatter, we were left with just over half the starting number. We removed the doublets and gated on the T cells, and this left us with just over 37,000 cells. When we identified the CD4 positive population, we had 23,000 cells, but the final T regulatory population, which is CD127 low and CD25 high, a positive, leaves us with just 992 cells, less than 1% of the starting sample. So, if we had any more gates, we would have very few cells indeed. Next is the choice of fluorophore. When a fluorophore, such as fluorescein, which was the first fluorophore to be commonly used in fluorescence, absorbs light, its electrons become excited and move from a resting state to a maximal energy level. The electron subsequently falls back to its resting state, releasing the remaining energy as fluorescence. This cycle lasts nanoseconds and can be repeated many thousand times, thus allowing recycling and amplification of signal. The emitted light typically contains less energy than that was put in to excite it. Therefore, the emission wavelength of any fluorophore is generally longer than its excitation wavelength. Although fluorophores will absorb and emit a range of light wavelengths, they have an excitation maximum and an emission maximum. It is the max excitation that will determine the optimum laser to use, and the max emission the optimal filter with which to collect the data. We can see the excitation max A and the emission max C values here on this slide for fluorescein. The difference between these two values, shown here as B, is called the Stokes shift, and it is this property 
that gives fluorophores their use in flow cytometry. In addition to single molecule fluorophores, tandem fluorophores are a clever way of increasing the Stokes shift to allow excitation and detection of more fluorophores from a single laser. They work by covalently linking a donor fluorophore, such as PE, to an acceptor fluorophore, which has a longer maximal fluorescence emission, such as Alexafluor 647. When the acceptor dye is excited, it transfers its energy to the donor dye in a process called Forster Resonance Energy Transfer, or FRET. So, although both are excited by a 561 nanometer laser, instead of emitting at 578 nanometers, as can be seen for PE on the graph, PE Alexa 647 tandem emits at 667 nanometers. Fluorophore brightness depends on how many photons a fluorophore emits when being excited by a laser and also the conversion rate of these photons when they hit the detectors and are converted into a digital signal. So what does that mean? Well, in the plot shown here of CDA and CD56 staining, Alexafluor 700, which is a dim or weak fluorophore, does not manage to separate the CD56, CD8 double population very well. FITSI, which is brighter, shows some improvement, as does Alexafluor 488, which is even brighter. PE, one of the brightest fluorophores when excited by a yellow-green laser, gives the best separation of the CD56 positive population. In this way, you can rank the brightness of fluorophores. More information and ranking can be found at www.bioradantibodies.com forward slash fluorophores, where we also have a poster available to download or request. Getting a good separation of your fluor populations is key, as it makes analysis much easier. Careful choice of fluorophore is also required because of spectral overlap. Spectral overlap can be described as signals that are detected where they're not supposed to be. It derives from photons from one fluorophore that has been detected in an additional, often adjacent, detector, resulting in false positive signals. In the top left image, you can see that the emission spectra of Alexafluor 647 has a long tail, so that some of the photons emitted by the fluorophore pass through the adjacent filter and end up being detected in the channel usually used to detect Alexafluor 700. And this can be seen in the bottom left plot. To manage the false signal, you need compensation, which is a subtraction of the false positive from the wrong detector. And this is done using single stain samples. However, compensation also leads to signal spreading, as can be seen in the bottom right plot. And this can lead to reduced resolution with dim fluorophores. Therefore, it is good practice to separate your fluorophores across lasers and filters if possible. It's not only neighbouring filters that can have unwanted signal. Tandem dyes can also give problems. Using the Z5 Spectra Viewer, we can predict the potential fluorescence from spillover from the 561nm laser and from other lasers due to cross-laser excitation of PE Alexa 647. As can be seen here, although PE Alexa 647 is optimally excited by the 561 nanometer laser, there's also some excitation of either PE or Alexa 647, the two fluorophores found in the tandem dye, by other lasers, and can be detected at both 578 nanometers, the emission of PE, and at 665 nanometers, the emission of Alexa 647, depending on pit upon which laser is exciting the fluorophore. We then stained human peripheral blood with CD4 PE Alexa 647. The dot plots shown of PE Alexa 647 on the X axis, plotted against the other channels on the Y axis, represented by the circles, show the actual amount of cross laser excitation and the resulting unwanted fluorescence, which can be seen in other channels before compensation has been applied. Fluorescence spillover and cross laser excitation will be a potential problem if you intend to use these filter sets to collect more fluorescence from other fluorophores and compensation will need to be applied. So how can the panel builder help you with your fluorophore choice? Well, the panel builder shows you the optimal channel in which to use all of your fluorophores. Then, once it is selected, it automatically prevents you from selecting a similar fluorophore with a similar emission wavelength 
so you no longer have problems such as GFP and FITSI selected on the same tube. So here you can see when CD25PE is selected, PE is no longer available on either the 561 or the 488 laser. If when we select CD127, Alexa floor 647, both Alexa floor 647 and the similar floor for APC cannot be selected. And this is repeated for every fluorophore you're choosing your panel. As you can actually see all the compatible fluorophores and how far apart they are with the lasers and the detectors, it is easier to separate out your fluorophores. To further help with fluorophore choice, there is also a spectra viewer on the panel builder showing the excitation and emission for each laser. So whilst building your panel, you can check for spectral overlap and change the fluorophore if there is not good separation. This can be seen here for a simple five color panel of Pacific Blue, FITSI, PE, PE Alexa 647 and Alexa 647. And note the large amount of cross laser excitation shown by PE and PE Alexa 647 from the 488 nanometer laser shown here in the red box. For more detailed information of, on this, go to our fluorescence and compensation webinar available on biorideantibodies.com. Next, we will discuss staining. There are some basic considerations for all staining. Firstly, stain your sample in a small volume to avoid excessive dilution of your antibody. A good place to start would be 1 million cells in a volume of 100 microliters, although you may need to optimize this for your own particular cell type. Next, if possible, stain your sample on ice. Keeping your cells on ice slows down death and the cell metabolism. Maintaining the cell viability but it can also prevent internalization of the antibody. Some antibodies are temperature sensitive and the binding is not optimal at 4 degrees, so check the data sheet if you're unsure. Also, some cells and some experiments require the cells to be maintained at room temperature or at 37 degrees, so check your experimental protocol. One thing to be aware of is that the antibody binding is a dynamic event and the time required for staining may need to be increased at 4 degrees to promote the on rather than the off step. Finally, I would suggest performing all staining with antibodies that have fluorophores attached to be in the dark or out of direct sunlight to try and avoid photo bleaching. In flow cytometry, there are three basic types of staining with antibodies. There is cell surface staining, which is the simplest and generally the easiest to perform when using directly conjugated antibodies. And this is due to the availability of specific antibodies and access to the epitope. Then there is intracellular staining, and this can be more difficult. Intracellular staining requires you to fix and permeabilize the cells to obtain access to the epitope. As there are a lot more proteins present inside the cell, the amount of non-specific binding can be increased. And you are often used to required to use indirect staining where unconjugated primary antibodies are detected with conjugated secondaries due to the lack of conjugated primary antibodies available. Whilst this has the benefit of amplifying your signal, it does also increase the background staining. And finally, there's nuclear staining. And this can be useful to determine cell cycle as well as nuclear localized epitopes. Nuclear staining, like intracellular staining, also requires fixation and permeabilization. However, in addition to permeabilization of the cell membrane, the nuclear membrane also has to be permeabilized for access of the antibodies. The staining protocol used can vary depending on the experiment and the complexity, but I just want to quickly walk through the basics. For more information on specific staining protocols, go to our website at biodantibodies.com forward slash protocols. So here we can see the situation when you have directly conjugated primary antibodies binding to different cell service targets, where you can add a mix of all your antibodies in one staining cocktail. If the primary is unconjugated, you can detect the, uh, the primary with a secondary that is conjugated to a fluorophore. And this has a benefit, as mentioned, of amplifying the signal due to multiple secondary antibodies binding. If you have a combination of conjugated and unconjugated where a secondary is required, staining can be more complicated. This is shown here where the primary antibodies are from the same species. Therefore, the secondary will bind to both conjugated and unconjugated primaries, giving 
false double positive signals. One of the way around this is to perform sequential staining and blocking. This is where the unconjugated antibody is detected with the secondary, then the cell is blocked or incubated in serum, and finally the, the second directly conjugated primary is added, as can be seen on this slide. You can also use primary antibodies from different species, for example rat and mouse, and the secondary will only bind to one of the primaries. For more information on available secondaries and to use a secondary selector tool, go to biradantibodies.com forward slash secondaries. An alternative to secondary antibodies is to use a conjugation kit. This allows you to directly label your primary antibodies, avoiding potential issues such as loss of cells through excessive washing and amplification of the non-specific signals. We have two easy to use conjugation kits that are quick and require minimum hands-on time. We have links kits that allow conjugation of up to milligram amounts of antibody to traditional fluorophores, enzymes and biotin. And we have ready link kits that have fluorophores specifically developed for use in flow cytometry that are suitable for smaller quantities of antibody. So how do you choose the right conjugation kit? Well, the panel builder can help. All the conjugation kits and custom antibody conjugation options can be located by clicking on this tab. This allows you to then select a free channel on your cytometer and on your panel that has a conjugation kit available. For example, the 69280 filter on the 488 nanometer laser allows you to have the following conjugation options and add it to your panel. To help you with your intracellular staining, I've listed on this slide a few staining tips which may be required to optimize your staining. Some epitopes and fluorophores may be fixation sensitive and therefore the choice of fixative may be important. For example, PE and APC are large proteins and therefore can be affected by alcohol fixation. The order of stain and fixation is also important. Stain surface antigens before you look at intracellular antigens as the permeabilization process can affect surface staining. Fixation can be done before or after surface staining depending on the sensitivity of the surface epitope. Convenient commercial reagents are available, such as leucoperm, which contain fixation and permeabilization buffers. Some detergents used in permeabilization, such as saponin, may need to be included throughout the staining protocol, including during washes, to ensure efficient washing off of excess antibody. Always use fixatives cold, as fixation is an exothermic reaction, and could affect your, your cells. Fixation may alter your cell size and the level of fluorescence, particularly with tandem dyes. Therefore, you may need to alter the forward and side settings when you acquire your samples. And, if you are comparing expression levels between samples, it is best to treat them all in the same manner to allow comparison. When adding your fixative, gentle mixing will help to prevent clumps, ensuring you have a single cell suspension. Finally, if possible, avoid using biotin and the fluorophore fitzy in intracellular panels. There is endogenous biotin in some cells, which will need to be blocked with unconjugated streptavidin to prevent high background, whereas fitzy has been shown to bind non-specifically through electrostatic interactions to certain cell structures, again increasing the level of non-specific binding. So the next consideration I want to briefly mention is the controls. As with all experiments, the right controls are important. And I have listed the most popular controls here, such as unstained and experimental controls, and flow-specific controls, such as compensation controls, and fluorescence minus one controls. For more information on these controls, you can go to biodantibodies.com forward slash FC controls, or watch our webinar on flow cytometry controls, in, entitled, Take Control of Your Flow Cytometry. And this can be watched on demand at biradantibodies.com forward slash webinars. So there's one control I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail, and that is the use of a viability marker to remove dead cells from your experiment. So why is dead cell removal important, and what are the best ways to do it? Well, it's important as dead cells have increased autofluorescence and have increased binding of antibodies through non-specific interactions. The result of this 
is that the negative population will be more positive and the dynamic range of staining will be reduced. And this can result in weakly positive cells and rare cells not being able to be identified from the negative population. Although dead cells often have a different forward and side scatter profile compared to live cells, and this method is often used to distinguish between live and dead cells, this is not always true. Using a simple forward and side scatter gate in this sample, we can see the C11B and GR1 staining in mouse bone marrow. As DNA binding dyes, such as PI or 7AAD, are not membrane permeable, and they are excluded by live cells and taken up by dead cells, they are perfect as viability dyes. They can be easily added directly to samples after they've been stained with antibodies. As can be seen here, dead cells with compromised membranes can be identified as they are fluorescent. And then they can be removed from your final analysis. We can see that if we add the same forward and side scatter gate to both the live and the dead populations, cells fall within the gate in both populations, regardless of their viability, showing why it is important to use a viability dye. If you combine a live cell gate with the forward and side scatter gate in your analysis, you can get much cleaner analysis. And you can see this with the CD11B GR1 positive staining. Here we can see two positive populations that are double positive, and there is no longer any cells located within the area shown by the red circle. Again, the panel builder can help with the choice of viability dye. In addition to viability dyes based on DNA staining, we have a range of fixable viability dyes with a wide range of excitation and emission wavelengths from ultraviolet to infrared. And all the viability dyes can be found and selected on the right laser and filter in the panel builder, allowing you to easily incorporate them into your panel no matter the size. Now here, I have selected one of our fixable dyes that is excited by the 355 nanometer UV laser as it is compatible with the rest of the five pa color panel I have created. And here we can see a complete list of both the fixable and non-fixable viability dyes available from Biod Antibodies. For more information, go to biodantibodies.com forward slash viability. Another step in data analysis is duplet discrimination. As the name suggests, it is to ensure you count single cells and exclude doublets from your analysis. So how do you do this? Well, doublet exclusion is performed by plotting the height or width against the area for forward or side scatter. As a particle moves through the laser, a signal is generated that increases and then decreases as it passes through the laser over time, which can be represented by this histogram. Doublets will have double the area and width values of single cells, whilst the height is roughly the same. Therefore, disproportions between height, width and area can be used to identify doublets. As can be seen on this dot plot, the doublets, here circled in red, are able to be identified by their increased area compared to single cells and excluded, ensuring only single cells are analysed. One area remo where removal of doublets is particularly important is in cell sorting. The cytometer cannot distinguish between a doublet or singlet for the fluorescence signal. Therefore, if you have doublets, you could reduce the purity of your sort by including negative cells. Another use is in cell cycle analysis. It is important to distinguish between single cells that have double the amount of DNA and doublets as they will both show increased fluorescence when stained with a DNA dye, such as propidium iodide. Fortunately, using the height or width versus area allows you to separate the doublets from the single cells containing 4n amounts of DNA. Cells containing 4n amounts of DNA, which are larger, have double the area and height values whilst there will be similar height but increased area for doublets. This will allow you to confidently identify the single cells that are in G2M phase, seen in the histogram of DNA staining. So let's look at all this together in data analysis. I'm going to show how simple sequential gating allows different populations to be identified. The staining panel I created was made to identify myeloid populations in peripheral blood. Using the principles outlined earlier, a live dead gate was used, followed by forward and side scatter plot, to identify myeloid cells, 
and then doublet discrimination was used to make sure we only collected single cells. In the top left plot, using CD15 and CD4, we could identify granular sites from monocytes and DCs. The CD15 positive could be ident further identified using CD16 and CD13 expression to see neutrophils and eosinophils. The CD4 positive cells could be further split using CD14 and CD16 into classical, non-classical and intermediate monocytes, with DCs identified by CD11B and CD11C staining. More information can be found at biradantibodies.com forward slash gating strategies. So in conclusion, there are many important steps to building a successful flow cytometry panel and Biorad's Panel Builder can help you at almost every step. It allows you to build multicolor panels in just a few simple steps, but as we've shown here today, it's also useful to check instrument configuration, fluorophore suitability, fluorescent spillover, and in choosing the right controls, such as a viability die. Watch our tutorial and try it out for yourself to see how the Panel Builder can help you. In addition to the Panel Builder, we also have a lot of other resources for flow cytometry and for other applications using antibodies. Go to biradantibodies.com forward slash resources to find out more. In addition to this webinar, we also have five other flow cytometry webinars available to watch on demand. They include more in-depth discussion on topics such as controls, fluorophores, multicolor panel building and apoptosis. So finally, I would just like to quickly remind you that we have antibodies, controls, proliferation reagents, flow supporting buffers, and much more to help you with all your flow cytometry experiments. Go to bioradantibodies.com forward slash flow to look at our complete range. And that brings me to the end of this webinar, and I'd like to thank you all for listening. Thank you for a really informative webinar, Mike. I will now open it up to questions. Okay, so let's answer some of those questions you have. So the first question is, uh, my antigen shows an increase in expression during my experimental conditions. Do I treat it as a high or low antigen density when choosing a fluorophore in a panel? Well, there's a couple of things here. Uh, firstly, consider um, how, just how high your antigen density will be in comparison to your other markers. And does this uh, change in antigen density uh, actually qualify as high or low, or is, it, or is it just higher than the baseline level? Uh, if you're using a bright fluorophore, you'll be able to see small shifts away from a low or negative expression. Uh, but if you have uh, expression levels which are raised really high, and, and maybe you know how, uh, how high that expression will be, you could probably use a dimmer fluorophore. Uh, so it's, it's probably good to check what other markers you have in your panel. If you're unsure about the level of expression, it's probably best to choose a fluorophore with very little spillover or cross laser excitation, and that way you'll be able to see your true positives and negatives. But, uh, one thing I would say here is uh, make sure you put an FMO control in, in this, uh, because that will help you accurately set your gates. And uh, oh, linked into that, we have a question, do I really need all these controls? Well, in short, yes. Um, if you set up your instrument and your experiment without these controls, really you're setting up uh, your experiment so it looks a certain way based on your expectations and uh, your experience. And if you do that, how can you really tell there is a change from untreated or negative um, and if you don't include these in your experiment? So really, if you don't include these controls, you'll get meaningless data. And reality says that these basically are invalid, and when you go try to publish, you won't be able to publish them, and you won't really make, be able to make valid conclusions. So what you'll end up doing is repeating them with controls, and uh, you'll probably end up wasting a lot of money and time. Um, so I now have uh, a question on compensation. So uh, why do we do compensation? Well, uh, in an ideal world, a fluorophore would only be detected in one channel. Um, but that's not really the case. 
uh, fluorophores have a wide uh, emission. Uh, so in simple terms, compensation removes this unwanted fluorescence uh, from other channels, the ones that it shouldn't be in. Um, and if you actually, if you want to find out more about compensation and fluorophores, we actually have a, we uh, a webinar available to watch on demand on our website. Uh, so we have a question on the panel builder. Is the panel builder compatible for other instruments uh, from other companies? Well, yes. Um, on the drop-down menu, you can select virtually any instrument that is available on the market. Uh, this, uh, this is constantly updated, so if you bought one of the latest instruments, it will be on there. Uh, if you've bought a custom build instrument, you can put in your know, custom lasers and filters, so you can build any instrument you like on there. And if you wish to add your institution, uh, we will be adding a link on our website soon so that you can include all the data in your institution as well so that you can pick specific machines. Um, I have a question now uh, about protocols. So most protocols for surface staining cells for flow cytometry say to wash the sample. Uh, I've tried analysis with and without washing, and I don't see any difference. Do I really need it? Well, it, you may have been lucky. Um, one of the main reasons to wash your samples is to limit the non-specific epitope binding, because uh, all antibodies actually show some binding to non-specific epitopes, usually weaker, uh, and this is on top of the high affinity binding with the, to the specific epitopes. So the washing will actually uh, remove this weaker binding to the non-intended targets. Um, and this is actually more of a problem if you've put uh, antibody in very high excess. So if you wash and resuspend your uh, sample at known concentration, you actually are able to acquire your samples at an, uh, a, a rate that is uh, suitable for your instrument, and you can remove the antibody that's in excess. Now, one of the reasons you may not have noticed uh, a difference in your staining is uh, that maybe your antibody was not in uh, very high excess. And uh, so you, you're actually seeing very little nonspecific binding. And actually, as I mentioned earlier, if you carefully titrate your antibody, you will limit the amount of excess antibody in your, in your sample. And uh, so you could probably get away with doing less washing. Uh, but I would always recommend to wash your sample just to be sure. Um, I've got a question here. Um, I want to stain and put neuronal cells through the facts. What's the best way to harvest them? Well, uh, I have never actually specifically worked with neuronal cells, but uh, I do know they, they can be quite sensitive uh, cells to work with, um, especially to uh, harsh treatments like trypsin. So I would probably recommend something like Accutase, which is a, a more gentle method of detachment. Uh, but maybe you need to try a few different methods to see which is the best one that suits you. Um, sometimes scraping cells can cause a lot of mechanical stress, and then you can see a lot of increased cell death. So uh, here, I would say that including a viability dye is very important, because if you are seeing a lot of death due to your sample preparation, you will be able to exclude all those dead cells um, from, from your sample uh, when you come to, uh, into the analysis. And probably, actually, you know, just, just doing a search online is probably the best uh, to way of uh, method of finding an appropriate method of uh, harvesting your cells. And then you can you know, use a search for your specific cell type. Okay, so um, the next question, should I fix my cells before reading them? Well, you don't have to fix your cells. Uh, you can uh, run your cells immediately after. Uh, staining without fixation. Uh, however, if, you, if you're going to uh, analyze them a long time after you've uh, stained, I would probably fix. Um, but you have to be careful about what fixing, fixation conditions you're using. Um, and I would also store them in the dark uh, at four degrees. And I wouldn't uh, leave them in the fixative either. Once they're fixed, uh, say if you're using PFA, I would fix for half an hour to an hour. And then I would take them out and resuspend in PBS 
uh, prior to uh, if you're storing for a long time prior for, to analysis. Um, if you're actually uh, making comparisons between experiments, I would make sure you treat the samples all the same way. So you either fix them all or uh, never fix, as it can actually alter the uh, forward and side scatter and fluorescence levels. So you could get some differences between experiments. So got a question here. What is the best viability dye to use uh, without worrying about the other fluorophores that I can use? Well, so this is one of the good things about viability dyes. Uh, you we have obviously we have a lot of different viability dyes, so we have viability dyes for every single laser. Um, so really, it's uh, it's it's down to your choice, and the panel builder can help you with uh, making that choice. But one of the things that I say is that because you're actually removing the the cells that are positive for the viability dye, you are also removing all the unwanted fluorescence because you are excluding the cells. So, in fact, uh, your choice of viability dye is, is really quite straightforward uh, because you won't have to do any compensation from any positive cells because you've removed them. And a, another question here, uh, can you stain T cells after fixation? Well, staining after fixation uh, can be done, but you have to be careful about uh, the antigen that's on the T cell surface. So a fixation can alter the antigen, uh, and so therefore the antibody may not bind as well as it did before. So um, you could, you, if you're worried about fixation, you could stain without fixing and with fixing and then compare. And if the level of staining and fluorescence is uh, still suitable for your experiment, um, then I would say yes. Uh, uh, stain after fixation, but you, I think you should definitely, you know, do the controls beforehand. Okay, and uh, another question: How long can you stay at store stain cells until analysis? Now, this will depend upon what fixative you've used. Uh, I would recommend if you stain, if you fixed with PFA, to not store longer than two weeks uh, in, at, at four degrees, um, and as, that's after you've removed them from the fixative. Uh, if you fix in ethanol, um, now I, uh, for samples such as so when you're doing cell cycle, you can you can leave them in the fridge for a, for a freezer at 70% ethanol for a very long time. Uh, so it just just depend upon your um, the fixative you've used. Um, OK, and finally, just the last simple question, how fast should I spin my cells when washing? Um, well, I would say use the lowest speed you can uh, to prevent damaging your cells, uh, but make sure it's fast enough that you don't lose your sample. Uh, so in here, we would use something around about 300 to 400 G. Uh, and of course, this is make sure don't use 300 to 400 RPM, because obviously that is different depending on which centrifuge you're using. And if you want to know more about protocols, we actually have some protocols on our website, which you, uh, you can access. Uh, and I think we have a link on the page. So, uh, Sorry to all those people we not had a chance to answer the questions. We will get back uh, answer the questions via email. Uh, and just just to remind you, this webinar is available to listen to on demand on our website. And uh, finally, I'd just like to thank you all for listening.